I receive everything that God has for me. If you receive everything, just lift your hands and say, God, I receive everything that you have for me. Thank you, Lord. You all may be seated. I thank God for his strength. Lord, you are my strength. And you are a strength like no other. The Bible says that the weak can say that I'm strong because of the strength of God. There are things that we go through and we don't understand how we made it. But it is because the strength of God is because he upholds us and he takes us through trials and storms and tribulations. It's through the strength of God that we make it to the other side. Someone called me and they asked me, Pastor, what are we supposed to do now? Because of all of the chaos and everything that's going on in the world. I said, we have to do what we've always done. We have to stand on the word. We have to be the light that people are looking for. We are the church. The, 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 the brick and mortar, it, 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 mortar is not considered the church. It's a place where we gather to honor God and to give God praise and to worship him. But you are the church. You are the epistle. You're the walking Bible. You're the one that people are looking to. So when they come to you in despair, pray for them. Give them the word of God. Give them the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Pray. We have to pray. In the book of Matthew, when Jesus asked his disciples to just pray with me, he didn't ask them to go and pray with him for one hour. He said, you stay here and watch and pray while I go over there. There are places that you cannot be concerning your loved ones or concerning your friends. But in the time that you have, you stay here. Watch and pray while they are over there. Because there are places that your prayers can go. There are places that your prayers can reach where you will never touch. But when you get down on your knees and you send the word of God, this is what the centurion told Jesus, the centurion soldier. He said, you know, I've watched you. You are a man of authority and you have people that when you say go, they go. When you say come, they come. When you say sit, they sit. When you say stand, they stand. He said, I have a soldier at home that's sick. He needs healing and I need you to help me. Jesus said, I will come to your home and I will heal your soldier. Hallelujah. The, the, the Roman centurion, he said, you know what? I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. There are people that are petitioning God. They believe God and they're not even worthy, but they believe him. He said, I'm not worthy that you could come to my house, but I have seen your words do what you say. So Jesus, if you can just speak the word, and tell my soldier to be healed. The Bible says that in the same hour, the soldier began to walk in his healing because Jesus sent the word. He prayed, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my Wicked ways, then I'll hear you from heaven. Yeah. 
word of God. He watches over his word to perform it. That's what we do. Praise the Lord. I, I, know, I know the praise team is supposed to come right now. But I feel this in my heart to do. God is not, he's not wishy-washy. When you wake up in the morning, he going to still be God. He's going to still be doing what he does. He's not getting ready to do anything. We say, God getting, no, you getting ready. I'm getting ready. God is already ready. So I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. To walk according to his will and to receive his blessing. I know Bishop is coming back. I know the praise team is. But let me do this before I take my seat. God has been blessing us. He's been blessing us financially. He's been blessing us spiritually. He's been blessing our health physically. I've seen God bring several people out of the hospital. They weren't scheduled to come out, but they came out. And we pray for those of you that have family members in the hospital right now. We just ask God to do what he said he was going to do last week. Just cover them in the name of Jesus. Cover them with your blood and your presence and your word. Cover the doctors. Give the doctors wisdom on what to do so that our loved ones can come home safely. But God has been blessing us. And Bishop has, he, God told him to, for us to give and to be blessed concerning the denominations of three. And since he said that, I've been looking at so many things concerning the word when it comes down to three. I've looked at the Trinity. I've looked at the body. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus' life was traded with three pieces of silver. The Bible talks about, I mean, there are just so many things that the, the you say you love me, and you say you're with me, but the before the cock crow, how many times? Three times you're going to deny me. And Bishop is going to talk about today your identity. Who are you? I'm, I'm not talking about um, Shana, I'm not talking about the public us. I'm talking about the private us. So he's going to talk about who you really are and what the devil is trying to steal and how God's going to give it back. That's going to be amazing today. But before he, before he comes today, I want to position you and allow you at the beginning of this year to release your tithe. But let me tell you how to release your tithe. The Bible says that 10%, we know that tithe means 10. And we are to give 10% of all of our increase. And if you were to look in the book of Leviticus, it said whether it be the seed or the fruit. So whether it's of the seed or whether it's of the fruit of the land, God says give 10. And if anybody decides that it's not good enough to give to God and you want to hold on to it, then when you finally give it, add a fifth part. So if you hold on to it and use it to buy something, God said, okay, well, when you bring it, give me 15. But we don't want to, we don't want to have to give 15. But if you owe 15, do that. But the Bible says that the 10% that he gives you, that we give back to him, is what? Holy. That's what the Bible says, that your tithe is holy unto the Lord. And we don't mishandle holy things. So today we want to release what is holy unto God because he has blessed us. And God says, I give seed to who? To the sower. 
Because if you have seed, when you plant it, it always comes back more than the seed. So God will give you seed so you can sow it and reap the harvest. So at this time, whether you're watching via Facebook, the website, if you're watching on, on YouTube, I want you to begin to get your tithe right now. Your tithe. It means tenth. I'm not talking about your taxes. That belongs to the government. Jesus paid his taxes. We're talking about tithe. Tithe continues the gospel, the good news, the temple of God, the worship, the message of God. People coming to the kingdom, that's what the tithe supports. So all tithers, I want you to begin to stand. Those of you that are watching live, I know that it's on the screen of how you can tithe. If you've never tithed before, just trust me. I am a product of tithe. The Lord has rebuked so much devour off of my life because of tithe. I've been able to buy things knowing that I can't afford it because God rebuked the devourer off of it and I was able to afford it in my price range. That's what tithe does. It rebukes devour. It takes the thing, the Bible says, it, it, the devourer is what the enemy attacks. God rebukes that off of your life. So right now we lift our tithe up before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you, first of all, for positioning us to have a tithe to bring. There are so many people that are unemployed, but you have blessed us. Hey, God, we are forever grateful. And we thank and praise you as we release our time. You protect us and you rebuke devour for your name's sake. And God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. If you agree with that, say amen. Nobody can do us like you do. Father, as I stand today to bring this word to your people, open up our hearts and ears to hear what the Spirit says to church, to the church. Let me minister with clarity and let the word that I speak bring increase into the heart of every hearer. Now, we thank you, God, for meeting us here today and for being the only God and Savior, the only one that we can go to in times like these. What we say and what we do, let it bring glory to your name. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray. Let every heart say amen. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. And those of you that are joining us electronically, again, thank you. Get your Bibles. We're going to the Word of God. We appreciate that we are now in a brand new year and with great new expectations. I don't know about you, but I'm looking to God to do some phenomenal things for me this year. Can I say that again? I am looking to God to do some phenomenal things for me this year. Um, enough is enough. There comes a time where God has to come in after Israel had been in Egypt for 400 years. God found Moses, and in so many words, he told him, enough is enough. It is time for Pharaoh to let my people go. And when Pharaoh refused because God hardened his heart to make it difficult for him to release them, God wanted to perform miracle signs and wonders to let Israel and Egypt know that it's been long enough. And I want you to know that the world is looking at the church and the church is looking to God. And I expect a move from God that will say to the world, enough is enough. I've stood all I can stand and I can't stand no more. You all remember Pop Popeye? Popeye he was a big armed cartoon with a big mouth and he was a sailor. And um, he would be whooped around by Brutus and flopped back and forth by Brutus and and when he couldn't stand anymore, he'd say, if that's all I can stand, I can't stand anymore. I've had all I can. And he'd go eat a, a can of spinach. And when Popeye popped that can of spinach open and that spinach got down in him, everything that had been tormenting him had to get out the way. Had to move because Popeye came with a fury and that fury was destructive. I'm here to tell you God is up to something. And we're going to see the hand of God move in a miraculous way for the people of God to know that he's still God and enough is enough. I may have to preach that one day. Get your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Luke. We're going to the, 30, the 22nd chapter and we're going to start reading at the first verse. It says, now the feast 
of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Now, of course, we reserve this text normally for Easter and resurrection time. and We don't talk about Judas until we talk about Jesus and the cross. But there's something we need to know in the beginning of the year, I believe, in this text. The Bible in the third verse again says, And entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. My topic for today is identity theft identity theft there well that's gruesome looking <laughs> great job identity theft really when you don't, and a lot of times we hear about it but we don't quite understand it but identity theft occurs when someone uses another person's personal identifying information like your name, identifying number, or your credit card number without your permission. It commits fraud in other crimes. It takes your identity and it uses it for their own advantage. As a matter of fact, the term identity theft didn't come into reality until 1964. And since that time, the definition of identity theft has been salutarily defined throughout both the UK, United Kingdom, and the United States as the theft of personal identifiable information. Identity theft deliberately uses someone else's identity as a method to gain financial advantages, other obtained credits, and other benefits that comes that's not deserving, but that has been stolen. And perhaps causes other people to be at a strong disadvantage or loss. The person who identity has been stolen and suffers many adverse consequences. For example, especially if this person who is falsely responsible for, per, 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 for, for acting like that. <laughs> perpetrating, I couldn't get them PPs together, perpetrating personal identity and perpetrating the theft this person, what he does is it will take your, use your birth date, your social security number, your driver's license number, your bank account or credit card number, your PIN number, your electronic signatures, fingerprints, passwords, and any other informational source that can be used to access financial resources. Believe it or not, in 2019, 14.4 million consumers became victims of identity fraud that's one out of every 15 people. Is that absolutely unbelievable? Overall, 33% of all U.S. adults have experienced identity theft, which is more than twice the global average. This country, this nation is the focal point of stealing people's identity. And then more than four, uh, and then one in four older adults, which is 55 years age of, of, or older, have experienced identity theft. And and one in five victims have experienced it twice. Consumers have lost $1.9 billion to identity theft in 2019. In other words, identity theft is when someone steals your identity to benefit their agenda. Can I say that again? It's when someone steals your identity to benefit their agenda. Now, when we hear about Judas, and we speak about Judas. Before I go there, I want to just give you this to understand. If this is happening in the natural world, in our society, I've told you before, you can look into societal circumstances, and you can see in society what's going on in the spirit. Uh, thank you, Jesus. You don't necessarily have to have a, 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 a prophetic anointing to understand what's going on when you see the signs around you. Uh, I was telling my wife something the other day. I said, honey, you know, you can drive in Milwaukee 
and never get off the road, never go into anyone's house. But you can just look at the cars that are driven and tell the change of the neighborhoods. That's not negative. That's just a fact. People who live in more affluent neighborhoods, their vehicles reflect the fact. When people live in more impoverished communities, their vehicles reflect the fact. You never have to meet the people. You never have to take a census of the area. You can come to this conclusion through observation alone. If in society, identity theft is 33% of the identities of people who live in America, if that be the fact that in America, we know then that Satan is coming after the identity of the church. Now, now I'm going to take a minute for you all to let that sink in. But if we can see this happening in the world, then we know that there is an attack then on the identity of the church. I think I used this topic not long ago. But the Lord spoke to me and said, use this because the church has to understand where we are. We are in a transition socially. We are in a transition economically, and we are in a transition spiritually. In order to see how it works, I want to bring your attention to Judas so you can see because this was the church at that time. I'm not talking about uh, the Jewish religion. This was the beginning. Jesus' 12 disciples, those he chose, they then preached out the church, and they won the world, starting going into uh, every land, preaching the gospel. So the commission was on the disciples who, had, who became the apostles, who were the first deliverers of the preached gospel and the kingdom to come after Jesus. Now, we know that Judas had a close a relationship with Jesus than most other people during his ministry. Why? Because he witnesses Jesus' ministry right up on him. He witnessed Jesus' teachings. He saw the many miracles, the many miracles that Jesus wrought. He was the treasurer of the group. And of course, he, uh, according to scripture, we know that he had a trusted position in which he stole the resources from. But the Bible tells us in John 12 and 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and that he had the bag and bear which was put therein. So Judas was a common name. So I want to just take time and talk about that. Because even though he was a disciple, you got to understand that in that day and time, the name Judas was common. It was common name in that area. There are several other Judases mentioned in the New Testament text. One of the other disciples was named Judas. In John 14 and 22, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot. And he put that in there for a reason. Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Second verse says, and so it was one of Jesus' own half-brothers, Mark, was all, uh, Mark also in the scripture says in the third verse, and not, his, not the carpenter of Mary and the brother, oh, they say, excuse me, they said in the book of Mark, the sixth chapter in the third verse, is not this the carpenter, the mother of of the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon and not his sisters here with us. And they were offended at him. And uh, in this passage of scripture, it says then that there was a disciple named Judas other than Judas. And then there was the brother of Jesus, his half brother named Judas. Now, when you look at this particular understanding, when the scripture speaks of Judas, it says Judas Iscariot when it's talking about the one who betrayed Christ. The Bible says in John 6 and 71, he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And he was that should betray him being one of the 12. You see, it had to be made clear that when Jesus spoke about Judas Iscariot, that people knew the difference because not every Judas betrayed him. Are you all here today? Not every Judas betrayed him. As a matter of fact, I'll read it for your hearing again. Jesus made it clear in John 13 and 26. He answered. He says, it, it is to whom I shall give sop when I have dipped it. And when I have dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And so the importance of the last name Iscariot was useful only to make sure people didn't get Judas confused with the others. 
Luke 22 and 48 says, but Jesus said unto them, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Now, you got to hear some truths about this. So we're going somewhere, but just look at some truths about Judas and his betrayal of Christ. Some of the things that we understand, as I said earlier, he was the one that kept the money back. So we know money was more important to him because he was a thief. He hovered over the money when the lady came with the alabaster box and broke the box and poured the ointment on Jesus' feet. The Bible says that the disciples said that they could have used that to help the poor. Well, that conversation was heralded by Judas. You got to understand that. And according to Matthew 26, 13 and 15, the chief priest paid him 30 silver, uh, 30 silver coins to betray the Lord. Matthew 26, 14 and 16 says, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot. Lord, you're going to help me with this. Went unto the chief priest, 15th verse, and said unto him, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And thy covenant with him for 30 pieces of silver. I will break my covenant with him. I will turn him over to you for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, the second thing you must understand is Jesus knew from the very beginning that Judas was going to tra betray him. He knew that Judas Iscariot was the one. The scripture tells us that uh, in, in scripture in the book of John, have not I chosen you, John the sixth chapter, the seventh verse, the 12, yet one of you is a devil. I want you to remember that point right there because in the number of Jesus' co-workers uh, 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 co or apostles or disciples, one was a devil. Now, I don't want you to take that lightly. That purpose of the devil being in their midst was to change the circumstance of their purpose. Help me, Holy Ghost. Again, the reason the devil was in the midst, his goal was to change the circumstance of their purpose. People of God, I want you to be aware today that the church is not relevant because we gather together. The church is not relevant because we love Jesus. The church is not relevant because we received him in our life as Christ. What makes the church relevant is that we have to be the light that sits on the hill that cannot be hid. We have to be the seasoning of the earth. We cannot allow our being and existence to just be another commodity in the earth that has no power or no authority. After we have been dancing and singing and doing our church performing, there has to be power in the church for the days that we are facing because it's not about what we look like. It's about the power that we bring to the table. I'll say it another way. We have gotten so caught up in religious rhetoric until we have failed to see how the devil is sweeping the world and the church in particular, sweeping through our identifying factors to try and cause us to look and to act like what we aren't. We don't have to apologize for being called out by God. We don't have to apologize for the power of prayer. As a matter of fact, we don't leave prayer because people think prayer is ineffective. We don't stop fasting because people think it's just doing without food. If we don't understand it is through prayer and fasting that these kind go without. See, there's devils and demons that exist that need power applied. Not a praise song, power applied. Not a praise service, power applied. Not just prayer, but power applied. And I'll say this, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. And so he didn't just go after any Judas. He went after the Judas that was close to Jesus. He went after the Judas that had the money bag. He went after the Judas that was influencing to the people, the disciples. He went after the Judas that was slick enough to do what he was doing and no other disciple ever got hope to it. Never saw it coming. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He went after a particular Judas. Lord, help me preach this thing. You see, the Bible tells us that at the Last Supper, Jesus predicted his betrayal and identified his betrayer. Jesus answered, the Bible says, is it one to whom I will give the piece of bread when I have dipped in the dish? Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. That's John 13 and 26. And the fourth verse 
it says, or oh, the fourth thing that you can see in John 13 and 10, Jesus said that Judas Iscariot was not clean. He had been born. He had not been, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. He had not been born again. He was not forgiven of his sins. He was hanging with Jesus. Do you hear what I just said? He was in the inner crew, but he was not born again. He was not clean because Jesus said in John 13 and 10, Jesus said in the 11th, 10 and 13, 10 and 11, Jesus said to him, he that is washed needed not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Judas was sitting at the table in a hypocritical manner, not receiving Jesus Christ as the son of God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus refers, when Judas refers to Jesus, he doesn't refer to him as savior, as master, as Lord. He refers to him as rabbi, teacher, diminishing Jesus's authority. He didn't call him Lord. He didn't call him son of David. He didn't call him Christ or the anointed. He called him rabbi, diminishing him to the ability of any other man. Notice what's in Jesus' midst. A thief who is not saved, that does not respect what Jesus stands for, and he's there waiting for an opportunity to take advantage of Jesus. Why did this happen? Because Satan will always show up and try to enter into the midst of those who are godly and try to change the flavor, the anointing, the direction of the church and the people of God. He is an identity theft, but he cannot take the church as a whole. So he works on individuals. I'm trying to help somebody in here. He will work on those who are not praying, those who are not really saved, those who have good religion, but they have no relationship. Those who understand what church work is, but don't understand the power of being in the body those who know how to say the right things to fit into the crowd but don't know how to get the devil out of the crowd you see satan is busy trying to change the identity of the church and it's starting with individuals secondly he wants to change your identity he wants you to be less than what god than what god has called you to be the church cannot try to fit in people of God you are not average you are not normal you're just not another person who gets up in the morning but you got to realize that you are the sons of God you are the household of faith you are the called out the chosen you are the set aside the set apart and if we don't remember that we're going to see social changes around us and if we're not careful the church will be sociable adapted sociably adapted to fit in to be accepted listen I don't care what you call me I will not bow my knee to some compromise I will not yield you can tell who is and who isn't saved by what they yield and give into I'm not talking about what they do I'm talking about the truth they stand on some of y'all ain't smoke a cigarette since you said Jesus is yours but you still got compromise in your life some of you haven't took a drink since you got salvation but you still got compromise in your life you don't really believe all of what God says because of fear and unbelief the church has been weakened but I'm here to tell you that God is exposing the devil and we're going to see him for what he is in this hour like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus knew. In fact, Jesus knew and allowed Judas to be empowered by the devil or to be empowered to do what he did by the devil himself. As soon as Jesus took bread, the Bible says that Jesus that had given him, look at what the scripture says, Satan entered into his heart. After the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, thou that doest, that thou doest, do quickly. He was deceptive. The other disciples had no clue. And this is a sad place to be in. Let me just have your attention for a moment. Hear me when I say this. The other disciples had no clue that Judas Iscariot harbored treacherous thoughts when he mentioned, when he, when Jesus mentioned him as a betrayer in their midst. The other disciples worried that it might be one of them. Did you hear what I just said? They worried that, that they wanted to make sure it wasn't one of them that was disloyal. 
For the Bible says in John 13 and 22, no one suspected Jesus. No one suspected Judas. He was a trusted member of the 12. Even when Jesus told Judas what he was about to do to do it quickly, the 27th verse of the 13th chapter says, and Judas left the supper. The others at the table simply uh, left, the, left, left the last supper. And watch this. And the others at the table simply thought Jesus or Judas had been sent to buy some food or to give something to charity. John 13 and 28 says, now no man at the table knew what intent he spake this unto him. And the 29th verse says, and some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against, against the feast or that we should give something to the poor. Judas had, woo, he had hid his intent from everybody that was at church. Uh, Y'all don't want to hear this. He hid his intent, sitting at the table with him, eating and talking with him, but they could not discern. Here is what I want to tell you. Saints of God, if there's ever been a time for us to start discerning what's at the table with us, the time is now. We cannot sit around, sleep. Lord, help me in this place. God is bringing judgment to the church. Now, Judas, we don't have to worry about Judas. But we have to be able to see who Judas is to make sure that Satan isn't doing it to us. You have to be able to see and discern what is and when. Sometimes, sometimes God ain't telling you to do nothing but pray. Because you can't, God said, let the wheat and the tare grow together. So you're not always responsible for the outcome. But don't sit up here blind with the devil, have his finger in your eye and don't know that is not godly. That's not how God does things. Stop playing like you don't see what's going on. Somebody got to open up their eyes and say, that's not how God acts. That's not how God moves. That's not the way God does things. God isn't slick and clever. God doesn't try to ease by. That's what Satan does he's the one who's slick and conniving and treacherous and deceptive and when you got tricks up your sleeves and deceiving in your heart trying to fool everybody the devil is a liar I declare that we're going to move into the time where you're going to be exposed by God we don't have to do anything just keep preaching the righteousness just keep living righteously but tell God God thank God it's not me and I know you're going to judge it sometimes you think it's your responsibility to get people saved it's not your responsibility to get people saved Jesus Jesus did that. It's your responsibility to tell people that Jesus saved. It's not your responsibility to make people live right. Jesus died for you to live right. He carried the sins of the world on his shoulder. It's your responsibility to live an example so people will know what living right look like. Are y'all here today? We have an identity crisis. Satan wants to steal the identity of the church. One by one. Notice what he does. Lord, help me preach this. Notice what he does. Judas is scared, betrayed the Lord with a kiss, trying to cover his treachery. I'm going to read a scripture and I'm going to tell you something about that kiss. While he spake, beheld a multitude, and he was called Judas. One of the twelve went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? Why a kiss? Because the kiss was the greetings of the saints. Greet thy brethren with a holy kiss. A kiss would diffuse the problem. A kiss would identify with the same. A kiss was enough for the disciples to think everything was all right because you don't kiss and betray. You don't kiss and destroy. You don't kiss and try to kill. You don't kiss and try to take advantage of. When there is a kiss, there should be kindness. When there is a kiss, there should be embrace. When there is a kiss, there should be similarity. When there is a kiss, there should be kindred spirit. Judas knew that the kiss was deceptive. 
smiling in my face and shaking my hands and have another plot behind you. God forbid it in the name of Jesus. God forbid it in the name of Jesus. Satan, you are a liar. The blood of Jesus is against you and we come against your deceptive tactics to try to get an advantage in the church to exploit God's people for your benefit. Father, let every Judas find himself hung by his own doings. Let every Judas find himself hanging at the rope of his circumstances. You may call that cruel, but the devil, the devil put in the heart of Judas. We know he wasn't saved because when it was time to repent, he did not repent. Judas was not recorded as being repentive. He was recorded as being remorseful. There's a difference in being repentant and being remorseful. When you get caught, you're remorseful. But when you want to change, you repent. Notice what the scripture says. After committing the act of betrayal, Judas was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver. Look at the word. Matthew 27 and 3. But when he learned, but when he learned that remorse does not equate repentance, read the scriptures. He'd rather make an amends to seek, you would rather, you would rather make amends to seek forgiveness than just repentance. He was remorseful. Read the scriptures, Matthew 27, 3 and 5. But he was not repentant. If he would have been repentant, he wouldn't have hung himself. But it was prophesied that this would happen. So he allowed, he allowed. Why Judas? Lord help me. I'm, am I going to finish this today? I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish this today. Because the question is, why Judas? Now, we know, again, the scripture says in the book of Acts, the first chapter, the 8th and 19th verse. It says his reward, uh, 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 with the reward he got his wickedness. Judas bought a field. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. If Judas had been repentant, he wouldn't have hung. If he would have been repentant, his guts wouldn't have bust open in the field. Don't y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm saying. There was a thief who was hanging on the cross with Jesus at the last act of his life while he was hanging, while one mocked Jesus and said, if you are who you say you are, come down off this cross. And the other said, how dare you speak to him, saying to him, forgive me. Or, or he says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says this day, Will you be with me? In his last act before he died on the cross, he repented. And repentance got him embraced. I'm trying to tell you in here, it's never too late to repent if you know you've done something wrong. I don't know, Lord, I'm going to say it again. It's never too late to repent if you didn't get it right. But if you're walking around here remorseful, you might hang. If you're walking around here talking about, I'm sorry, you might hang. But if you say, Lord, forgive me, I don't want to do it anymore, then you can live. The church has to repent. I don't know why God is taking me this way. But we're going to have to stop. Let me take this out. We're going to have to stop and repent and ask God to forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our treachery. Forgive us. I'm talking and I don't know who I'm talking to. Forgive us of the trickery that we've done. Forget up. Forgive us of the self game. Forgive us of the compromise. Forgive us of letting the devil speak in one ear and we act out what he says in our desires and in our efforts. Forgive us for singing one thing and living another thing. Forgive us, God, for setting traps for our brothers and sisters. Forgive us, God, for speaking harm and doom to those who are in your body. Forgive us, God, for being low in our faith, slow in our desire, slow in our prayer. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, forgive us. Repentance means you turn away from it, never to return to it again. 
As I speak to you all, there's somebody listening to me that's even further than this church that I feel by the power of the Holy Ghost that there's a good thing that God is doing. But if you don't want to repent and you're just going to be remorseful, oh Lord, these kind of messages, I hate to go back and look at them again because they're things I never planned on saying and I hear God saying it as I'm saying it. It's not my best, it's God's word. Somebody needs to hear what God is saying. That in this hour, before we can move forward and see the great things that God has for us, we have to stand up in the identity of who we are and be strong in the Lord. Satan entered into the heart of Judas. That's why. Of course it was prophesied. Of course Jesus knew it. Of course it said it would be done before it happened. It helped complete the plan of salvation. But Judas did not have to be the one. Judas yielded to the influence of the enemy and became the one that Satan used. Why not Peter? We know that Peter was a, we know that Peter would cuss. We know Peter denied him. We know that Peter uh, 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 was the one who showed more flesh than anybody as a matter of fact when Jesus came back to get Peter he wasn't clothed right he had to put his clothes on right after Jesus rose again we know why not Peter because Peter had a different responsibility Jesus knew that Peter would eventually get his heart right Jesus knew that Peter would get himself together he told him you love me feed my sheep feed my lamb feed my sheep and he knew that that would come and Peter wrote about those things in the book of Peter Judas was not repentive he was just remorseful so so there is no hope for remorseful people who will not repent. God is not looking for you to be sorry. He's looking for you to be right. You don't have to just be wrong or sorry because you got caught because that doesn't mean change is coming. You have to be godly sorrow brings repentance. Godly sorrow bringeth repentance and repentance brings God into your situation. Church, before we can... Before we can move forward, somebody got to stand to say, God, I repent for what I've done. I repent for how I've been acting. I repent for the things that I've allowed to exist in my life. I repent for my compromise. I repent and I want you to change me so I can be what you want me to be. Let righteousness come from me. There has to be real repentance. And God has taken over this message. He's taken me away from my points to declare is a day of repentance so the church can really be seen what it is. All this playing and gaming and scheming and striving and strifing. God has given us an opportunity to get it right. Don't take, don't think for one moment that we're not gathering together, that this isn't a good time for you to go into your prayer closet and get yourself washed and clean. You don't have a lot of distractions anymore. There's not a lot of stuff that you can, you ain't got to go a lot of places. Uh, as a matter of fact, some places are still shut down. You go in and shut in and let God use this as a time. So when you come out of your prayer closet, it. When you come out from under this uh, restriction that we're in and when you come out from under that into the covering God has for you, you will see the power of God. I say this to the church. I speak this as a man of God. I won't fit. I won't finish. I'm going to finish. See, God's desire is for the church to glorify him and to bring glory to his name, to expose the enemy in our worship and our praise and our life that we live. Judas, root name is Judah. Judah comes from the tribe of Judah, which is praise. You've heard me say it before as I close. The Bible says that we his people are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to be changed that we can prove what is that good and perfect will of God. That pleasable, that perfect, that complete will of God. Judas was created to praise. To betray means to offer up. Instead of Judas offering up praise, he betrayed and offered up Christ. Your purpose that God has given you, Satan wants you to lose your identity and instead of giving praises to God, we become compromised and we can't find God. Where are we going? What is needed? I want you to lift your hands. Thank you, Father. Wherever you are, lift your hands. Even at your home, lift your hand. I, I want to lay hands on you, but I I'll just pray a prayer towards you. Because I feel by the power of God, as I look at what he's given me to minister, I feel by the power of God that when we renew our mind 
or when we change our mind to God's desire and not fashion it according to what the world is saying. And that's where I thought I was going with this to help us see how the world is trying to fashion the church and how we are trying to be so close to the world until our identity doesn't even exist. But what I see here is God using this for an individual time of inventory. A time to say, Father, I'm not going to allow this year to exist and I not know you. Whatever it is that the enemy is trying to influence me to become, help me to walk in what you called me to be. Help me to be what you have called me to be. I repent today, right where you are. I repent today. Anything that I've allowed to exist in my life that causes who you are in me to be diminished and the identity of your power to be lessened. We thank you, Father, as the church. We stand in your midst saying, Father, like never before, keep us focused on you forever moving close to your throne. Keep us before you in prayer and supplication. Let us seek after you like never before. Let us find you in days like these because we need to know you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And I thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you're at home listening to me, let me share this with you. Because this message went on a whole nother direction than I thought. But there's something in it for you, something necessary, not just for us that's in here. But somebody who was listening to me, maybe you had been compromised in your walk. Maybe you thought that it didn't matter anymore because you don't have the audience or the opportunities that you had to display what you have in you. And the enemy tries to lessen what God has given you. I hear God says your repentance will cause your return to the things that I've called you to do. Remorse says, I'm so sorry, but godless sorrow brings repentance. And if you can do that, you're going to experience the height of God's desire for you. It's all about God being seen in us in the earth. God's glory being revealed. Thank you, Jesus. And so if you have him in your heart, then allow him to be your God. If you don't, stop now. Ask him to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. Ask him to save me, Jesus. Make a difference between clean and unclean. Save me. Save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. And I want to thank you for saving me. Fill me with your spirit so I can live with you in eternity. In the name of Jesus, I pray and I thank you for it. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a hand praise. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. Let's give God a hand praise. Let's give God a hand praise for real. Glory be to God. Let's give him a hand praise for real. God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to get your, get your hearts ready to release your offering while you're doing that. There's this little song that I wrote some years ago. Let me hear the key of C sharp. B flat. What I have may not be much In the eye of someone else It may be limited By human frailty And no, it can't compare To the gift with me you share It may not be much But I gave it, Lord, to thee No glory in my name no praises do I claim for what I am it's all because of you oh Lord eh? and no it's not mine to keep so I lay it at your feet all that I have I give it Lord to thee and oh I give you my so I can walk in your way I give you my heart So you can speak to me And instruct me how to pray Lord, I give you my mind My heart so you can feel it with your love And to you I give my soul To dwell with you above Some it may not be much, but that that 
what it is and give it back to thee and oh no glory in my name no praises do I claim for what I am it's all because of you yeah yeah oh. and no it's not mine to keep so I lay So you can speak to me and instruct me when I pray. I give you my heart so you can feel it with your love. And to you I give my soul to dwell with you above. I give you all that I have. And to some it may not be much, but that, that it is. it is I give it Lord I give it back to thee oh, oh, oh I'm glad that it is I give it back to thee yeah that's where we are today God give me you and I give it you give I give you me and you give me you that's where we are today the church is in a good place because the world is in a dark place. Did you hear what I just said? The church is in a good place because the world is in a dark place and we have what it takes to bring change. I want you to get an offering. I want you to sow today. It's important that you recognize that when you give, giving is not just an action. It's not just an act, but it's an attitude. The Bible says that you do it not grudgingly or of necessity, but God loves a cheerful. There's an attitude. You know, back in the late 80s, the early 90s, right along that time when the word movement was really getting strong, um, somebody would say, it's offering time, and people start... get loud and they go to whip whistling and yippee yay and then getting out a dollar. You know, they, it's offering time. Woo! Listen, cheerful is not just a sound you make. It's the attitude in which you give. And so when we started our church, people started yippee yay and when it came time because God loves a cheerful giver. But cheerful and noiseful are two noise. Noise is two different things. Cheerful ain't noiseful. No, cheerful is not noiseful. Is that a word? Well, it is now. Noise don't always mean cheer. Noise can mean fear. It can mean fright. So the attitude in which we give is the one that God looks for. I want you to get an offering. For some of you, this may be your first offering you've given this year. But I want it to be one with expectation. And as you get that offering, those of you that are at home, thank you for staying with us because we encourage you to do that from the beginning. Thank you for staying with us. I want you to get your offering. You see, as a matter of fact, how important it is to give. I want everybody, as we pray, to lift that offering. Father, I thank you and I praise you for the offerings that your people are releasing. And we give them as unto you. But we do it cheerfully, not noisefully. And we thank you for a cheerful giver. For you said it's the liberal soul that will be made fat. The attitude of giving is one with joy. As we do it, let there be increase in the life of your people. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. I want you all to begin to release those seeds and give as unto God. One thing that is so important that you remember that I minister today. That Satan entered the heart of not just any Judas. But the Judas that was close to Jesus as a disciple. The Judas that was talented, the one who could carry the money. The Judas that was intelligent because he was scheming. The Judas that was impressive 
the one who the people impressed with $30, the one that was a thief, the one that had ability, and his name means praise. The devil don't come after folk that ain't got nothing to offer. So you know if you have something to offer, he wants you to use it for him. Don't let people make you abort what God has put in you to become. People will say things about what you do to make you question if you should be doing. They'll say things negative about your anointing to make you question whether or not you have one. And they will cause you to abort your whole call because you got distracted by that trick. I call it a vice. I call it a, a scheme. Don't think more about what people say than what God says about you. Amen. You'll mess around and lose your anointing listening to somebody who never had one. And people be saying, what happened to her? She used to be, or what happened to him? He used to really, it's because the devil used schemes to come and steal your identity. You can still be saved and not know who you are because the devil will try to confuse you. Know you are a child of God. Know that you are anointed for times such as this and your gifts are given to you by God to use for his glory. Stand to your feet, everybody. Lord, I thank you. Let's thank God for the word today. Come on, let's thank him for the word today. Let me say this in advance. God gave Pastor Brandon a powerful series, a message on sin. He started it on last Tuesday. I'll say God gave him a powerful message on sin. He started last Tuesday. And I've asked him to complete that series on sin. And so Pastor Brandon will be sharing with me. I will be here on Tuesday night, but he will be sharing with us in our Tuesday night service. I want everyone to get out and you got people that are doubting their salvation, people that need to be saved, have them tune in to Tuesday night teaching. Pastor Brandon has a powerful word from God to give an understanding of what the scripture says about sin and about the things that the enemy will use to make you doubt whether or not you really have God in your life. I also want you to join Pastor Pam and I on Thursday night for our Moments in Marriage. And those moments in marriage have been very instructing and very encouraging to married people. And I don't want to, I don't want to deviate from where we are right now. And then one last thing, next month on the 14th, we're going to celebrate her 60th birthday. And we're going to celebrate. I know y'all have heard about it already, but I got to say something about it because I'm telling you, we are blessed. Pastor Pam and I, we've been pastoring this church this year, will be 32 years, if I'm not mistaken. And she's been with me every bit of the way and look like the longer I keep her, the younger she get. I tell you, we're gonna really, really celebrate this woman of God. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this time of sharing now as we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence. Those who have joined us electronically, God, we thank you for them as well and thank God for their desire to be here. They just can't. Now be with us as we go and bring us back, excited, knowing what the word said to us, helping us to realize and to keep encouraged and not distracted. And now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in all the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end is my prayer. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Let every heart say amen. Go in peace. Take Jesus to the world. Tell a dying world about a living Christ. Those of you that have joined us on the internet, let me just encourage you to be with us not only on Tuesday night, as I said about Pastor Brandon, but I also want you all to be excited about the services. You are a part of what we do. Let me say that one more time. And I want those of you that haven't walked out yet, I want you to celebrate what I'm saying. You are a part of what we do. And so you're not being here physically doesn't mean you're not here spiritually. We want to attach to you. Come on, Pastor Pam. And we're going to pray God's blessings over you that sat with us through the whole time of sharing. Our internet audience, those who have joined us electronically, there's a whole lot of stuff on the internet. It's a whole lot of stuff. It's almost discouraging. Some people says, I'm not going to even fool with social media. 
But at this point, this is the way that God has given us a tool to minister to you. So make sure that you participate, not only on Tuesday night, but when you hear the events that we're having, we automatically mean you. Let me pray God's blessings over you as well. God, we thank you for your blessing for those who are not here. We thank you, God, for your covering and the protection of those who cannot be with us in the building, but they are with us in spirit. God, we thank you for the Christian faith church that's at home right now and not in the building. Their hearts are here, but their physical bodies are at home. We minister to them with the same intensity and desire. Touch them, cover them, and keep them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, let your blessings be upon us all. Amen. Amen. God bless you all again. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. We look forward to seeing you again.